Well, we're going to be wrapping up today our final uh, message uh, on the book of Revelation. So we've been in this study now for a few months, actually probably three months now we've been in this study. And the last few messages we have entitled Unshaken. And I wanted to share with you once again what the definition of unshaken means. It means not disturbed because you, you stand on a firm foundation or a firm position. It means to be steadfast and unwavering. Well, there is no question that we're living in a day and time where things are definitely shaken and not normal, or I should say not normal to us for sure, and we're living in those days. And you can just watch the news and see that we are just having a time in the history of our world where things are just so uncertain. I mean, if you've watched the news this week, um, as COVID is kind of beginning to de decelerate, if you will. Um, now we have people riding all over the country with the horrific event that took place in Minneapolis, and there's all kinds of hostility and anger and unrest and just crazy things that are going on, and it's, it's just a marker for the days in which we're living in. And so for Christians today, there's a reason that we need to know the Word of God. There's a reason we need to understand uh, what God has already told us in his word so that we're able to live a life that is unshaken when this world is greatly um, unraveling. And we're going to see this continue to happen as time progressively moves forward. So um, I want to just share with you some great encouragement from the word of God today. It's going to be a little bit unorthodox in that we're going to basically kind of start and go all the way through the Bible in, in, in sections, if you will, just segments of it, as we look at why we know as Christians we can live this way. Now, how many of you like to read a good book? Anybody out there? Yeah, more in this group than in our first group. We had uh, lots more people in our first group, but very few people raised their hand that they like to read. Well, um, I really, growing up, was not real fond of actually taking time to read much of anything. Um, I don't know if that's just true of boys in general, um, but I know for me it was that way. I'd rather have been outside playing, doing something, uh, anything other than reading. And so one of the things that I, I tried to do was to outsmart my teachers at school. And anybody here try to do that? Every one of you, right? Maybe some of you were excellent students. I find it very interesting that as much as I hated to study when I was in school, ironically, I have to spend so much time studying now. <laughs> so it's like God has a great sense of humor. You know what I mean? Uh, it's like, really? Yeah. And so, uh, so what I did was, is we, we have, periodically they would assign us book reports. I mean, that's just what they did. Uh, I don't know if they just wanted to keep us busy. I really don't quite understand what this was all about. But they would assign a book report, and usually it was a book that I really couldn't care less to read. So it wasn't a Louis L'Amour or a Zane Gray, you know, or something that I really loved to read. It would be something way off the, you know, chart. I mean, just something that was so out there. And so what I decided I would do is I would simply read the first chapter, and then I would skip every other part of the book, and I would read the last chapter. And so then I would begin to write, and it would sound pretty good at the beginning, and then I would just have to bubblegum my way through the rest of it, and at the end, I ended with a bang. Uh, but my teachers figured out real quick uh, that I didn't read the rest of the book, uh, especially with all the red ink they would put on there. Well, one of the great things that we know as Christians is we have the Word of God. And we not only have been given by God the beginning of how it goes, and not only has God given us the end of how everything is going to shake out and what he's going to do, if we skip everything else in the middle, we're not going to fully understand all that's taking place even in our day. In fact, the book of Revelation was written in such a way that it is now bringing the finality and the compilation end of everything that began in Genesis, it's bringing itself now to a fulfillment and a final end that God has already told us about from the very beginning. He's already given this to us. And you really can't understand Revelation unless you spend time in the rest of the book. Why? Because so much of what we see in Revelation is interpreted or we're actually learning about it somewhere else in Scripture. And so God has written it in such a way that for us to understand He's already given it to us a lot of times in other parts of the Old Testament or even in the New Testament. And we're able to understand what God was trying to tell us about the end of time. And we know that the world is headed that direction. 
and that since the time of Christ, we literally have been living in the last days. But we are progressively, as we have seen and learned, that we are moving at a high rate of speed toward the, the end of days, or what the disciples called, disciples called the end of the age, uh, or, or your second coming. And we know that Jesus Christ is coming again, and he's already given us the answers to these things in his word. So the truth is, as Christians, we do not really have to be shaken in our day and time. Because God has already told us what is going to take place in these days that we are living in, not only now, but in the days to come. And as we learned about this last week, that before you have actually delivery in labor, during the labor part of that, you have these birth pangs that begin to happen. And Jesus said that when you begin to see these things, these are just the beginning of birth pangs. But as we get closer now to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom here upon the earth, these things are going to get closer together and they're going to get more, uh, more difficult or stronger in, 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 in what's happening. And so they're going to become faster and faster, and then they're going to get stronger. And as we are living in our day, what we are living in is we're living in the time of the birth pangs, and we're seeing this. And we begin to see these things starting to happen. They're getting closer together, and they're getting stronger, and they're no longer just isolated in pockets of the world. It now has become the entire world, and these things are happening in our day and time. If we do not understand the scriptures and we don't understand why all this stuff is taking place, you will be rattled in this day and in the time we're living in. And not only now, but progressively more as time goes on. But see, Christians, we're not citizens of this world as we learned last week. We're actually citizens of heaven. And so from there, we have a perspective that is different than the rest of the world. The other thing is this, for Christians, you need to, to understand, and I'm, I'm understanding these things, that when I know how the story ends, it effectively changes the way that I live in the now. And so I already know that God has given us in Scripture what's going to take place in these latter days. I already know that because God showed us in His Word. So by reading the end of the book... I'm able to understand that the way that I live in the present is impacted in a different way because I know how this thing ends. And so we do live life here on earth with that in mind. And so our perspective as we look at the world is, is a different lens of looking at what's taking place in our world. We see it differently. And so as you see these things happening, and, and I say this, and I, I firmly believe this and mean this, what we're experiencing now is not the last thing we're going to experience. It's just simply one of many things that, are, that is coming. It's, it's just not going to stop. And so if you've read any um, books in recent days, normally the author will have a foreword on the book. And I have some books that I have and some books that I read. And I, I'll read the foreword. And usually the foreword is from someone that is either, either highly respected in that field. Maybe they're a professional. Maybe they've written other books and they're esteemed at a high level. And so they will, for this author, write a foreword uh, about what this book might be. Or the author may even write the foreword. So if I was going to write the foreword now for what we see in Scripture, I would like to take you to Isaiah chapter 46. We know what it, what it tells us in the beginning. And this is what's really sad for me. What I see in our day is, is, for whatever reason, pastors are not wanting to deal with Genesis and they're not wanting to deal with the book of Revelation. They'll, they'll teach in other places in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but they want to leave the book covers alone, the two ends. Because there's so much controversy in our day that many people teach that the book of Genesis is really nothing but a bunch of allegory. It's a bunch of symbolism that what we read about in the book of Genesis simply has a spiritual meaning or a connotation to it that those were not literal things that happened. But that is a lie. The truth is Jesus quoted about things in the Bible like he talks about. As, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about these events as actually taking place and happening. Why? Because they really did. But you'll find today that there's people that do a very, very, very... Um, discredit to the word of God and to the body of Christ when they take Genesis and they say that this just is nothing but spiritual allegories. That's all it is. That Noah was really not actually swallowed by a giant fish and spent three days and three nights in there. That didn't really happen. That's just a spiritual allegory. Well, Jesus said that wasn't a spiritual allegory. That really happened. And so they stay away from Genesis or they make everything just a story. 
And what you find, especially in our day and time, and really in the last 50 years, what they've tried to do is discredit Genesis, the beginning. And they've given the whole world a whole new hypothesis of what Genesis is all about. That this all began, not by God, this began from just some sporadic event that took place and all of this stuff that we see, all the order that we see, all the beauty that we see, all the design that we see, everything in its perfection, location of where we are in the galaxy, distance from the sun, the way the earth spins and rotates on its axis, everything in our ecosystem, this all happened simply by a chance implosion. That's it. And what they will do is they've, they've taken our younger generations, and you are a part of that generation where you have been taught in your school system that really God is not something we discuss. Don't discuss God. That's just something that you can believe on your own time. But here in the academics, we're going to teach you a quote-unquote theory about how all this stuff came about. And it's nothing but a bunch of lies. What is it? It's to discredit and get rid of God of all creation and to make man now the God of where he is in his own creation, in his own life. And so they discredit Genesis. And in the book of Revelation, we have the end. So we know now how this whole thing ends. So if I was going to write a foreword and use a passage of scripture that would describe as we begin now this study, this real quick study through today, this is where I would go. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's found in the Old Testament. And if you only read the very beginning and the very end, you wouldn't read this passage of Scripture to teach you something about the nature of the God of whom you serve and know. And this is what he says in Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. Remember the former things. He's speaking through Isaiah to the nation of Israel. He says, remember the former things of old. For I am God... And there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Now I find it fascinating that if we would just live our lives and if people would just acknowledge this verse, that there is one true living God, that he is the God of all creation, he is the all sovereign, he is the God we will answer to, he is the God orchestrating his plan and working things out upon the earth. But when you tell everyone that God is a figment of their imagination, or it can be a tree, it can be a rock, it could be that, that shoot right there, God could be absolutely anything of your own making. We discredit the fact that this is the truth, that there is one true God. That's the truth. And he says... He's going to show now his sovereignty. And this is incredible. I want you to grab, this, grab what this says. Not only is there none like me, there's lots of false man-made gods out there. And they're prevalent in this world. But he says, I declare the end from the beginning. I declare the end from the beginning. In other words, from the very beginning of time, God says, I've declared the very end. And in fact, in Genesis chapter 3, we read about what God said to the serpent, Satan, as the curse was going out. He says, the seed of the woman will be against the seed of the, man, uh, uh, the, seed of the serpent. And the seed of woman will crush his head. And from the very, very beginning, we see this. And then we see, not only after there was sin in the garden, we see that God did something, that he covered the sin of Adam and Eve figuratively, if you will, with the skins of an animal. We see a sacrifice happen in the Garden of Eden. And the blood was shed in the Garden of Eden. And an animal, an innocent animal, gave its life's blood, and God covered Adam and Eve with garments of fur. And then the story begins to play out as we make our way through the book of Genesis and how God now begins to work and orchestrate his perfect plan, his sovereign plan. And he has declared from the end what will take place, or from the beginning what, what will happen in the end. From ancient times, things that are not yet done. We know that throughout Scripture that God has already told what's going to take place in the future before it ever does. For example, if you never read the book of Daniel, God gave us something incredible in the book of Daniel, in the prophecies of Daniel. He's already told us through a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar every single Gentile kingdom that would remain as kingdoms on the earth until he sets up his kingdom here upon the earth. So he tells a non-Jewish king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar through a dream that there's going to be five more kingdoms and that's all there's going to be Gentile kingdoms here upon the earth. There already was what? The Assyrian. 
and from the Assyrian, the Egyptian, then Assyrian. And then we move to what? We move to the Babylonian kingdom. So here, starting with the king of Babylon, he says, You, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. And then he begins to tell them the remaining kingdoms of the world. Listen, only God could do this. And God is so good that he did this for us. He did this for them then. God is showing his sovereignty. He says, from the Babylonian empire is going to come another empire. And we know that we have the Medo-Persian empire that followed along. And he gave great description and even said who that empire would be. And then from that, he says, there's going to come another one. And it's going to be the Grecian empire. He already showed us that throughout history. And we know, if you study your history books, that after the Babylonian empire... The kingdom or the empire that ruled and defeated the Babylonian Empire was the Medo-Persian Empire. And then from the Medo-Persian Empire, Alexander the Great came along and he wiped out the, the Persian Empire. He wiped them out and he took over. Now he was ruling over the world. But then that didn't last because who comes along? He's killed. He raises up his four generals, take four different parts of his kingdom, and they are defeated now. Finally, Rome defeats the Grecian Empire. So Rome is going to be on the scene, but Rome won't be the final, if you will. Something happens in this vision as God says this empire is going to actually divide, and we have Eastern and Western Roman Empire that actually took place and happened. But down the, 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 the image now, we see these feet of clay and iron, and he's being told now, but this is going to be a revived kingdom, and this is going to be a ferocious kingdom. In fact, when you have iron and clay in the ten toes, he's pointing now to a revived Roman Empire in the last days, right before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This Roman Empire is going to be revived, and there's going to be a ten-king federation, a part of this empire. And we know today that that ten federation king, kingdom is going to give all of its power to one. And who is that going to be? The Bible's already told us he's going to be the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. So what is happening in your day and my day right now as we live in real time? We are living in the very days of the revision of this Roman Empire, where the whole world now is trying to build for itself a new world order. And if you've been through any of my teachings on the new world order, you'll understand that this is happening in our day. Watch the news, listen to the reports, listen to the world leaders, and they're all telling you the exact same thing. The Pope himself is even talking about how we all need to be part of a new world order. And what is he going to do? Well, there's a part that, that this whole system is going to have in this one world governing over this world. Our own presidents have mentioned it over and over and over how we're nearing this opportunity to bring forth and give birth to this new world order. And it's coming. In fact, it's already here and being implemented in your day and my day. Why will this not rattle you, Christian? Because God already told you all the way back in the book of Daniel that this was going to happen. We already know this. You know what this does? This confirms the sovereignty of the God in whom you serve. It shows you his absolute, complete control over the events of the world. That's what it shows you. And if you're truly in Christ, the last thing you need to hear is a bunch of bubblegum-chewing messages that make you feel good about the day and, and all these things about how to live your, your best life now and all these things that people want to hear today. You need to know the truth of the Word of God. Why? Because as these birth pains begin to come quicker and quicker and quicker, you as a Christian will not be rattled. Why? Because Jesus Christ told you these things were coming. You will be firm in your foundation. And the church needs to know the things that are happening today. The last thing you need is another message about bulls and blood and bronx and mud. You don't need that message. You need to know the Word of God. You've got to know the Word of God today. You need to get a hold of it. People say, well, we don't do that at Cowboy Church. Are you kidding me? If we don't, we need to shut down every Cowboy Church in this country. We are here for one reason. Yes, we love our culture. But I don't worship my culture. I worship God. We built this arena for a purpose, to reach the culture and to use the culture to reach the uncultured for one reason, not so we can talk about it, so we can tell them about Jesus. That's the only reason we built this thing. It is something we can use for the glory of God. Why? Because we're living in a day and time where people need to know that Jesus is coming and he's coming soon and he could come this very moment. And if they die without Jesus Christ, they're going to a place that the Bible has already told us about called the lake of fire. And it's forever and ever and ever. And some of you might think, well, John, that's just a story. It's not a story. It's a real place that people are going. So that's why we built this. 
Not so we can just rope and have fun, although we'll do that. It's so that people will come here and hear about this. And yesterday, yesterday evening, I spent time with one of your brothers in Christ, who you don't even know who a month ago was doing just fine. And in one month, he went from doing just fine to just a short time to live. Cancer has taken over his entire body and there's nothing else they can do for him. In one month, this took place. And he called me and said, would you please just come and pray with me? And I came and I prayed with our brother and I spent some time reading him the word of God because he needed to know and be encouraged and be reminded about what happens when he slips from this earth into a place called eternity. And what people need to know today is what's going to happen in the last two minutes come to their life. And every one of you sitting here, if Jesus Christ does not return, there's coming a day in your life where you have two minutes left and you may know it and you may not know it. And if you knew you had two minutes left, the last thing that anybody's going to ask you about is what color a horse you ride, what is his pedigree, do you ride in a Ford or a Chevy or a Dodge, and what kind of trailer do you pull? Is it a single axle, double axle, triple axle? Hey, let's talk about your cow herd. No, what they want to know is how in the world can I know what Paul says, for me to live is to... For me to live as Christ and die is gain. They need to know that when they suck in that last breath and they're rattling in their lungs as they have the death rattle going on, that they can be surely confirmed and know that when they suck in that last breath, that the moment their heart quits beating and their spirit leaves their body, it's not going to matter what horse they rode, what pedigree was, what truck they drove, how big their ranch, how small their ranch. Only the thing that's going to matter is if they know Jesus in the last two minutes of their life before their life is taken from them. That is it. And so when we have events here, we're not going to just have some hodgepodge little old Bronx and Brud message and people laugh and get... No, we're going to tell people that, you know what? This could be the last two minutes of your life. And if it's the last two minutes of your life, you either know it or you don't know it. And if you're dying of cancer, you know your two minutes is close. But if you're 20 years old and you're living high and fly, you may not realize your last two minutes is going to come driving home that evening. And what we want people to know is this, that life is uncertain, death is certain, and you better know for certain who Jesus is because it's coming to all men. That's why we are here. That's it. We built this incredible arena by God's grace and mercy so that people by the droves can come here and they can hear about the only thing that will save man for all eternity. That's it. And we want to have a good one and a nice one, and we are, and we will. Why? So we can glorify the name of Jesus, that's why. And so someone can hear about the God of all creation that did something incredible in His Son before the foundation of the world, gave His own life, poured out the wrath of God upon Jesus so they didn't have to receive the wrath of God. They can have His righteousness, forgiveness, and they can be adopted into the family of God and know this Creator that made them for a purpose and for a reason, and ultimately it's to know Him. That's what it's about. And so for Christians in our day and time, man, we don't have to be rattled. No need to be rattled. Because we already know how the story ends. So before we get to the end of the story, I'm going to take you through a real crash course here as we've been through the book of Revelation. So we know in chapter 1, we're introduced now to, to John. John's the last apostle alive on the earth. And Domitian has exiled him to the island of Patmos where they would send prisoners. And he has been now sent there as an exile for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he's there on the island of, of Patmos, and he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And he has a vision. He hears, he hears something. He turns around, he looks, and he sees the glorified Christ. And he gives a description of Christ in chapter 1. And then before Christ, he sees these seven golden lampstands. And there's, there's someone in the midst of them who looks like the Son of Man. It is Jesus Christ himself in the middle of his churches. And then in chapters 2 and 3, we have these incredible letters who were written to seven literal churches in Asia Minor in the day of John. And he's now writing these letters specifically to these churches. But it's, only, it's not only for those seven churches. It's for the church of all time because there's way more than seven churches in John's day. And these churches are symbolic of churches of all time. They're symbolic of churches in our day. But also every single one of these 
actually lines up to the church age. And if you study the church age, you're going to see every one of these churches in form, moving their way through the church age, clear to the Laodicean church, which is the church that is lukewarm. And Jesus is literally on the outside of the church. And what do we see the Savior of the world doing in, in the midst of his church? He's outside. And he's beating on the door of the church. Because the church in our day has no room for Jesus. It's got all kinds of room for programs, all kinds of room for this, that, and whatever. But Jesus, we can put him out there as a name, but is he really the focus of what we're about? In the Laodicean church age, the church age we live in, we're living in that time where it's lukewarmness. And that's exactly what we see going on in our day. Churches that are full of people who have itching ears. They don't want to hear the Bible. Don't tell me the Bible. Don't tell me about hell. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say this to me. We don't want to hear hell, fire, and brimstone preaching. Are you kidding me? People need to know that there's really a hell. They need to know that people are really going to go there. That this is for all eternity. That it's not just a figment of our imagination. No, we've watered down the gospel. Made it all about man. God's here as a genie in a bottle. And he's here to make sure that your life is just in place, just right. And he's going to meet all those things that you want to do. That's the American gospel. And people flock there because they want to hear how good they are. And the truth is we need God desperately in our life. They told us in the Bible this is going to happen in the last days. Men are going to have itching ears. They will put before them men who will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. What it says in the last days. So we have to preach the word of God. It has to be the primary thing of what we do. So these letters were written to seven literal churches. They apply to the church age that we're living in and even the churches in our day and time. And then when we get to chapter 4, John sees a doorway in heaven. And John hears a voice and it says, come up here. So John now is taken up into the throne room of heaven. And John now lays out for us a, just an incredible picture and description of what he sees as he steps in the throne room of Almighty God. It's incredible as he describes the, the, the throne and who's seated on the throne and those that are around the, the throne, ministering around the throne and all the angels and everything that John sees. It's absolutely breathtaking. And then we get to chapter 5. We see something else that's very, very incredible. All of a sudden, when we get to chapter 5, we see something there. It's called the redeemed of the Lord. In chapter 5, the redeemed of the Lord are there and they're singing the song of the redeemed. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ, you know what it means to be redeemed. You know that. But you're not going to fully understand it or appreciate it in its magnitude until you stand before the throne of Almighty God. When you stand in the presence and the glory and the majesty and the splendor of God, of all creation, that we can't look upon His face and even live, that is going to be an incredible moment. And when you realize that you're in heaven and it's not the crown that you have earned... It is simply the Stephanus crown of conquering and victory that was given to you because Jesus Christ conquered and he was victorious. That is an incredible thing. And there we see, as we get down on our knees before the throne of God, after we sing this incredible song of the redeemed of the Lord, we cast our crowns before the throne of Almighty God, not because we earned them, but because He gave them to us and provided a way that we would have victory through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we now are covered by His blood. We are made righteous in the eyes of God. And we will one day stand before the all triune Godhead and we will be there in the presence of Almighty God and we will simply take off our crowns and we will toss them before the throne as we worship Almighty God. That's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. Well, when we get to chapter chapter um, 6, we see some, some other things that are fascinating. In chapter 6, we see that the seals are going to be opened. In chapter 5, though, there was no one in heaven that was worthy to open the scroll. And in God's right hand, he held the scroll that had seven seals on it. This is the title deed to the earth. Very important. If any of you own a piece of property, how many of you have a title deed to it? Anybody have a title deed to their property? Well, I'll put it this way. If you own it, you have a title deed to your property. How's that? That means you own it. You have rights to it. It's yours. God's holding the title deed to the earth that was lost in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam came under the authority of Satan and he lost what God had already given him, his rightful place to rule here upon the earth. 
He became subject to Satan. Satan takes that authority, and now he rules and reigns on this earth as the little G God. That's why he offered the kingdoms of the world to Jesus before he went to the cross. And Jesus says, I'm supposed to worship the Lord God and worship him only. Jesus didn't say, no, these kingdoms are not, not real. Satan, I have these kingdoms. No. Jesus won the victory to have the right to take the title deed to the earth from the enemy, being the second Adam who came. And he is the kinsman redeemer that we read about in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ redeemed what was lost by the first Adam. And he comes and he says, there he is. Don't weep, John. The Lamb of God, he has conquered And he is worthy to take the scroll from the hand of God. And Jesus walks over there. The line of the tribe of Judah takes the scroll. And in chapter 6, he begins to open the seals. As he begins to open the seven seals, we notice that there's things happening upon the earth. There's wars and there's pestilence and there's droughts and there's earthquakes and famine. And all these things begin to happen as these riders come out on the horse. And we have the white horse, the four cowboys of the apocalypse. We see them ride out. First, it's the white horse. And then we move along. We have war. We have death. Then we have the pestilence that follows behind all of those things. Death finally is riding along with with death and Hades behind him. So it's, it's an incredible picture of what we see happening. And it's the tribulation that's coming upon the earth. And these things are going to happen closer together and get worse and worse and worse. And then we saw in chapter 7 the sealing of the 144,000. Well, who are those? Some people say, well, they're the church. Well, they can't be the church because the church is in heaven. Well, who are these? The Bible says they're from the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, God's going to go back to Israel and focus his attention on the nation of Israel during the seven-year period of time because he still has something he has to fulfill and promise to the nation of Israel. So I don't believe in the replacement theology that's been very prevalently taught in the day and age in which we are, where Israel has no part in anything to do with God in the last days. That's not true. If that was the case, Israel would have ceased to be a nation and ceased to even be a people that you could find on the face of the earth a long time ago. But in 1948, God ensured that that was not going to be the case. And from the time of the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70... They have been dispersed across the four corners of the world. And in 1948, the sovereign God of all the world who said to Daniel, I'm going to tell you the rest of the time period for your people and the city Jerusalem. If you'd have told people a hundred years ago that this is literally going to take place, they'd say, well, that's got to be a metaphor. That has to be the church. That has to be something else. That's got to be spiritual Israel. No, let me tell you something. In 1948, God did something through the hands of men. He established a people who had been gone from their land, who had been spread across the four corners of the earth, and who had been attempting to be wiped out by, by, by humanity. God says, nope, 1948. They became their own sovereign nation. In a day, they were born. And since then... They have become one of the top ten nations of power in the world today. And every time you look at the ink on a newspaper or you read some ad on your, on your phone or your computer, if you look at the news somewhere within the news somewhere, you turn through the pages, you're going to find Israel and you're going to find Jerusalem and the Middle East is always going to be at the center of everything that's going on in the world and it's the center of everything that's happening now and it will be the center of everything that's going to take place even into the millennium where you and I will reign with Christ for a thousand years from Jerusalem. It's incredible. Why? Because God is sovereign. He makes known the end from the beginning. That's incredible. So the 144,000 are the sealed Jews that God will seal. 144,000, 12,000 from the 12 tribes. And they are going to what? They're going to share the gospel. The Jews are still waiting for Messiah to come. The false Messiah is coming. We know the Antichrist is coming. They're going to fall for the Antichrist. And we have the false prophet who is the anti-spirit. The Trinity, false Trinity is coming. And he's going to try to usurp all of those things. And he will for a while, but it won't last. And so we see here that the 144,000 will be propagating the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an incredible time that's going to be as we see um, God working through these that will be sealed. In other words, they won't be able to be harmed while they're here on the earth as all the, the judgments of God begin to be poured out here upon the earth. Revelation chapter 8, we begin to see the trumpet judgments being poured out on the earth. This is not going to be a time in history where anybody's going to want to live. I can tell you that right now. Jesus said it'll be a time like there's never been from the beginning and no, never shall be again. It's a time of tribulation. And so the seven trumpets are being 
poured out upon the earth. And then we saw in chapter 11, the two witnesses. And if you watched my message live stream or on, on Wednesday, I told you who the, two met, who the two witnesses I believe are according to Scripture. That they're going to be in Jerusalem. And they're going to, for three and a half years, they're going to be what? Prophesying and, and, and preaching the gospel. And they're going to be doing miracles. But they're also going to shut up the heavens so there's no rain on the land for three and a half years. And we know that Elijah was one that God used to shut up the heavens for three and a half years. And then we also know that we're going to be able to turn water into blood and do any plague of any sort as often as they want to. And when you go back to the law and the prophets, if you look at the law, that's Moses. And Moses was the one that God used to turn the Nile into blood and to do the other, the other plagues that he did on the nation of Egypt, on the Egyptian nation. So I firmly believe that they're going to be Elijah and Moses. And if you look in Matthew and you look at the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus Christ took Peter, James, and John up there, what did we see happen on the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter sees Moses and Elijah. They show up on the Mount of Transfiguration prior to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Peter's like blown away. So here they are speaking to Jesus before his crucifixion. And then when we find at the resurrection, the Bible says there's two men dressed in white. And they address those who come to find Jesus. And then we see at the ascension, there's two more men dressed in white. And they tell the disciples, why do you stand looking into the heavens? This Jesus whom you saw leave is going to return in like manner that he left. And then we see these two witnesses once again, bearing witness to the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And during this time, they will for three and a half years be pre prophesying and be, be giving witness to what they know and see. And they're going to be the law and the prophets. Why is that important? Because Israel is still under the law according to their, to, their, to their teaching. So they still follow the law, the Old Testament law, and the prophets. And so the law and the prophets is going to come to them, and they're going to bear witness to who Jesus Christ is, that he was the true Messiah. And this Antichrist, who will be possessed by Satan himself, performing miraculous signs and wonders, will be leading the world astray, and many will be taking his mark and worshiping his image, and they will be going along with this new world order system. But God's going to be sending these people to to share the truth with the nation of Israel. We know the Bible tells us that two-thirds of the Jews are going to be killed. Two-thirds. Seven or eight million were killed during the Holocaust. A lot more are going to be killed during this tribulation time. But we know a third of them will be saved. A third of them will be saved. <clears throat> so after the two witnesses in chapter, in chapter 9, we have the seventh trumpet blown in chapter 11. And as the seventh trumpet is blown, we, we met these next three figures. In chapter 12, we see the dragon. The Bible gives us great description for who he is. He is Satan. He, he, is, he is the deceiver. He is, he is he is Lucifer. He is, he, that's who he is. This is Satan. And we meet him here as the dragon. And what is he going to do? He's going to raise up one out of the sea. And this Babylonian system, this new world order system that's going to be in place, rising up out of this confederation of the old Roman Empire, which is a very large area in our world today. It all, all right there around the, the Roman area, including Germany and all these other countries. He's going to rise up this Antichrist and this Babylonian new world order system, and he will be ruling the world. That's why they're trying to implement this even in our day. And then the next one we meet is coming up. And he rises up out of the earth. And who is this going to be? This is the false prophet. And the false prophet is going to be doing something too. He's going to be bringing the world together. Just, just was it two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, they had, for the first time ever, all the religions of the world came together under religious unity. The Pope set the day. And they all joined together in religious unity, to pray to God. Well, if you have a million gods, which God are you praying to? For a Hindu, there's no end to the number of gods they have. So what, what are they praying to? Well, they might walk out and pray to a tree. They'll walk out there and pray to a, to a rock. You have all these religions in the world that have answered a question to who Jesus is, but only one says that He is the Son of God. Only one, that He is God. So... So now we have in Rome the Pope that is coming out of the Roman Empire. Here we go. And what is he doing? He's doing something that's never been done in the history of our world. All the way back to Babel. What's happening? You cannot have a unification of the world unless you have a unification of religions. Cannot happen. 
Why do, why do they hate America so much? Because America is about nationalism. Nationalism. Why, are, why do we see the politicians trying to destroy nationalism in our country? That there's actually something to be proud of to be an American. That we, we, we are different and we're a great country. And why are they trying to tear this thing down and wreck it so fast? Why are they doing that? Because you can't have nationalism if you're going to have universalism. You have to get rid of nationalistic mindset. That's why the Pope has nothing good to say about Trump or America. Why? Because we're, we're, we're the fly in the ointment, man. We've got to somehow get rid of that deal so that we can make everybody all on the same page in this entire world. All about equality. All about equality. The poorest nation and the richest nation, not going to be any distinction. Let's just spread it all over everywhere, and we're all going to be ruled by what? The rule of law, not the rule of the jungle. Because the jungle has a whole lot of animals and a whole lot of different kingdoms. But when you have the rule of law, there's only one rule, and it rules. And so this religious figure is going to bring together all of the pagan religions, and we're seeing it. How in the world can pagan religions join with someone who calls himself by the name of Christ and tell them that they're praying to God just like I am? That is called ecumenicalism. And what is that? That's bringing all the religions back to where? This empire. Do you not see all this coming together? It's the revision of the empire. The last empire made of clay and made of iron all mixed together with ten toes in a ten federation kingdom. It's all coming together. And they're all going to be set up. And you can't have it without a world religion. So what's the Antichrist going to do? He's going to look to the false prophet. The false prophet will be speaking on behalf of the Antichrist, who is a part of this new world order. And the whole world is what? You're going to be required to get in line. Fascinating to even see the things we have going on in our day. The push for everyone in the world to get this vaccine everyone not only that but we got to get everybody id because there's poor people in this world that have no identification are you kidding me what's going on here we're standing on solid ground why the bible tells us what's going on some of you say well john i don't like to hear this well stick your head in the sand and be shaken you're not going to thwart it and we're not going to stop it but what we can do is we can walk in victory through it do you know what I'm saying? It's here, whether you like it or not. For a Christian, it ought to, well, yeah, baby, we know we're here. In other words, when I know the end, I live differently in the now. When I see all these things happening, I don't get shaken. What do I do? I say, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And we are in constant turmoil all over the world. Well, it's what Jesus said it would be in the last days. So we have the unholy trinity. We met them in chapters 12 and then in 13. We have next the seven plagues, and this is going to be the finality of God's wrath during this time. And in between here, we know that there's war in heaven, and something happens in the heavens. Paul says that he was taken up into the third heaven. So we have different levels of heaven. We have right above us this atmosphere, and then we have the second and then the third. And Satan, we know, is the prince of the air, of the principalities of the air, where he rules in the air. And that's why in Daniel, when he prayed to receive a message, he had to fight, the angel had to fight his way through the heavenlies to get the message to Daniel. And that's why it was such a struggle for him. He said, when I leave here, I will have to go and fight the prince of Persia. There was a battle going on between the heavenlies from heaven to earth. There was a battle going on. It took 21 days until Michael, the, your angel, came and defended me and helped me get through. I was, re, I, was, I was held up there. And so Satan will lose a battle in the heavenlies. He will be cast down to earth. And then he's going to be confined here upon the earth. And that's when he will, what? Possess the Antichrist himself. Now, you and I meet people today who are possessed by a demonic spirit. I've met several of them. You probably have met them. Other parts of the world, you'll see them. But this individual will be possessed by Satan himself. And then, literally, all hell begins to break loose. So, we aren't going to be here then, thank the Lord. Um, but it's good for us to understand what's going on in our day so that we're not shaken. 
And then in Revelation chapter 17, we met the great whore, the prostitute, which will be the, the church in the end of all these different religions all together in this universal church under this guise of God, whatever that would be. Many roads to God. You take one, I'll take one. We'll just ride along together. And then we know that that is defeated. Babylon itself will be defeated. The marriage supper of the Lamb, the greatest potluck in the history of the world, will happen as Christians gather before Jesus Christ, and we'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then secondly, in Revelation chapter 19, we're ending up nearly close to the end, and we have something incredible happen. If you read with me in Revelation chapter 19 real quick, I'll show you. In Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11, John writes, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like the flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. In the armies of heaven, and we know that that includes not only the armies of heaven and speaking of the angels, but also in Zechariah, he tells us that the saints are returning with him when he comes, that we are going to return with Christ. In the rapture, in chapter 5, when the rapture take place, Jesus is in the clouds and the church is going to be taken to him. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to meet him in the clouds. But when he comes again in Revelation chapter 19, the church is coming with him to earth. And we see ourselves returning with him to earth. And from his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword to which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the, the winepress of the fury and the wrath of the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we know during this time, we're going to witness this, the Antichrist and the false prophet and Satan will be captured. The Bible says in, that the Antichrist and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. And then Satan himself will be thrown into the bottomless pit and bound for a thousand years. And during that thousand years, you know what Christians we're going to be doing? The Bible says we're going to be ruling and reigning in the millennial reign of Christ where he will rule like it should have been in Genesis. He'll be ruled in perfection. And we're going to get to live during that time like it should have been during the time of Eden. We're going to get to live in that experience with God, with Christ, and we'll rule and reign with him here upon the earth. I hope that encourages you some today. I know it does me. It greatly encourages me. And then one of the things going to happen here after the millennial reign, Satan will be released for a short period of time. And then you and I are going to watch as God himself captures Satan and throws him into the lake of fire. The one that is deceived, the one that is destroyed, and the one that has, has, has lied all these millennia. God will throw him into the lake of fire. And then comes the new heaven and the new earth. The new Jerusalem. But God will set everything right, all things new. And just like in Genesis, we see the tree of life in Revelation chapter 22. Once again, we have the tree of life again, where we will be where we should have been in the beginning before the fall of man. The kinsman redeemer redeems absolutely everything. A new heaven, new earth, a tree of life where we will live forever and ever. What an incredible God we serve. Amen. One final thought as we close this final bookend. Over and over in this last chapter in 22, we read, Behold, I am coming soon. In verse 12, it says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning, and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, everyone that loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for what? The churches. Have not seen the word church since Revelation chapter 3. But in chapter 22, we see it again. Why is that? Because in chapter 5, we're the redeemed around the throne. In chapter 19, we are the bride of Christ coming back for the marriage supper or having the marriage supper of the lamb and then we return with him as he comes to the earth and here he gives this letter 
this revelation to the churches. And then he says in 17, the spirit and the bride. Who's the bride? The church. Do you know what the church says? Come. Why would the church say come? Because we know where we're going. <laughs> and I've often said this. One of the reasons I think that God hasn't put a tremendous amount of knowledge for us about what heaven would be right now at this moment is because we would never, ever, ever have one ounce of contentment living here. And the truth is, if we understand the truth of Scripture and the reality of this, we can, like Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We know where our final destination will be, and that will be with the Lord. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who desires to take the water of life without price, who is that? It's Jesus Christ. So even now while we're here on this earth, living in these days and time, what do we say? We say, come. And yet we know that the door is still open, and that's why you and I are still here. So we can tell the world this incredible message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they don't have to go to a place called the lake of fire one day. That they can spend eternity with Jesus Christ forever. That's why we're here. Amen? Amen. Well, that's a lot to cover in a short period of time. I hope that you understand now, knowing somewhat of the end of the story, that you don't have to be shaken in the day you're living in. And for us to live is Christ. That's the truth. And to die, it's gain. So I hope that encourages you today. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would use these words to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ. What an, what an incredible time in history to live. And, and yet, Lord, you just tell us to, to live and to, to enjoy life and to, to share the, the good news of the gospel as we go along. Thank you, Lord, that we can live in a way that the world can wonder and watch. And Lord, what a privilege it is when we have opportunity to tell others about this great message of salvation, this incredible gift of grace that is for all who will repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, they too can be saved. This is the gospel. And Lord, it's not our job to force anyone, to beg anyone. We simply share the story and let the Holy Spirit do what only the Holy Spirit can do, and that is to bring new life to a dead person. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.